Well, this weekend, an interesting festival took place at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. The festival is called the um, Scientific Film Festival, the Sci-Fi Film Festival. Any of you sci-fi fans like science fiction? All right. Some of you, John back there, Rick. Yeah, science fiction. And it was listed as the weekend for the weird. <laughs> the weekend for the weird. The reason it's called that is because they go back and show a number of Hollywood films, particularly targeted towards science fiction, that um, would be, in most people's estimates, called cheese. <laughs> Geez, probably not the best. It started Friday, and it will end today at about 5.30 with the showing of The Matrix, the showing of the film The Matrix. One of the films that they showed yesterday was a 1951 classic called The Day the Earth Stood Still. Do any of you remember that movie? Yeah, most of you do. The Day the Earth Stood Still. You remember that particular film, all of a sudden, a big shiny white space capsule lands right in the middle of Washington, D.C., remember? And uh, people are wondering what it's all about. And people are wondering what's inside. And suddenly a man descends out of the capsule and there is also a robot, you remember? The film was designed to try to answer the question, is it possible for someone outside of ourselves to come in and rescue us from ourselves? to save us from ourselves. And as you uh, know from watching the film, that is not always an easy answer, is it? <laughs> because the movie gets a little bit caught up in a lot of uh, issues that surround the space capsule, Washington, and the public. The film festival, going on tonight, and if you want to go see The Matrix, go see it tonight at 5.30. The question that was asked by uh, some of you, was what's the difference between Lord and Savior? What is the difference between those two? And why does the scriptures, or why do the scriptures use those words so often, Lord and Savior, particularly when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ? And what's the difference? Is there a difference between those two? Is there a difference between calling Jesus Lord and Jesus Savior? Is, is Jesus both? We would say yes, but what really is the difference here? And why are those words so important when it comes to talking about Jesus? And so we're going to answer this question today, Lord, Savior, what? Because some people often wonder, well, what, what is the distinction here? Uh, what is the difference between these two particular words? Let's begin by talking about the word Lord. Let's begin by talking about the word Lord when it comes to the person of Jesus, and when it comes to scriptures. There's a number of uh, usage of the word Lord in the Bible, a number of them. Um, and if you race through Matthew, you're going to find that this word Lord is used in the New Testament, particularly a number of different ways. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, it's used of the Father when Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus uses it to describe his Father. As you race on through Matthew, you're going to find in Matthew chapter 13 that the word is translated sir. It's sometimes a, a courtesy word. This is used in the parable when Jesus goes, says that the owner of a vineyard goes away and comes back. And all of a sudden the wheat and the tares uh, grow together. And uh, these people come up to him and say, sir, didn't we plant wheat? Sir, that's the same word for Lord. It's a courtesy word. Um, you might hear some people use it formally, like in a film, for example, in Braveheart, the prince, uh, princess to come in Braveheart addresses Edward the Longshanks as sir, as lord. She says, my, my lord. But that's not really saying he's ultimate authority. That's just a courtesy word, a word that sort of elevates a person's position, but it's a word of courtesy. In other passages uh, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 8, it's also translated owner, owner. When the owner returns, and remember the owner returns and he decides he's going to give wages, it says the owner summons everybody. That word is also there. So you're getting a hint here of certain courtesy words and, and words of ownership, words of um, leadership. But you will also find that it is used of Jesus 
And it is interchanged with the word Jehovah in the Old Testament, as we'll see in a minute. The word Jehovah in the Old Testament, which was a word that was a combination of the word Yahweh and Adonai, actually. They put those together because the word Yahweh originally was so sacred in the mouth of the Jews that they decided, no, we cannot utter that word. That word Yahweh, which was given to Moses, is a word we can't say because it's really the most personal name, as we'll see in a moment, for God. And it's used over and over again as one who has absolute authority or one who um, has absolute power. And you'll find this particular use of the word in a number of passages. For example, if you write down Acts chapter 16, verse 31, a, a very familiar passage, you remember the story here. Paul and Silas are thrown in jail. And um, as I like to say, it was the very first jailhouse rock ever written. And we read about that. We read about the fact that all of a sudden there's this great earthquake and um, the guard comes rushing in. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says to him, what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That word there is, is a word that is related very closely to the word Jehovah or Yahweh in the Old Testament. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives oversight, control, the one that we've been singing about, the one who uh, controls our lives. You'll also find this word used in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, uh, where Paul is trying to get to kind of the essence of what it means to believe and the assurance that that gives us. And so he says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, these words, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. There it is. That's in essence the confession that anyone who wants to be a follower of Jesus as Lord has to make. You have to confess him as Lord, and then you have to believe in him within you, within your being. You have to say, yeah, I believe that with all that is in me. I believe Jesus Christ is the one who controls my life and controls the world. And then there's a, another great scripture, which we say a lot around here. 1 Peter chapter five, uh, 3, verse 15, where Paul or Peter says there, sanctify Jesus as Lord. Sanctify Jesus. Set apart Jesus as Lord. Set him apart, Jesus as Lord. Set him apart. Which means that um, when it comes to looking at Jesus, he's more, more than just a good teacher. He's not just a, a good moral person, although he was. He's not just a, a rabbi that came on the scene and suddenly left. No, he's Lord. The scripture says he's Lord. And so when a person is, is coming to Jesus, they're coming to one who is not only a great love, but he is also a great Lord. He is a Lord. He's one who controls all of the life that we have. Lord of all the world. In the Old Testament, um, the word Lord is used as the most personal name of an all-powerful God. Yahweh, Lord. The most personal name. And this is the name that Moses got at the burning bush. And again, this is the name that Jesus claims for his own and others call Jesus. But it's the one that Moses got when uh, he says, I am who I am. I am who I am. That's my personal, personal name. And David picks this up in, in the Psalms. In Psalm 1, he says, what? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law he meditates day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord, the law of Jehovah, the law of Adonai. His delight is in that particular law. In Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord... Same word, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Funny, people always say, see, if I delight myself in the Lord, he will give the desires of my heart. That means anything I want, God will give me. But what is to be the delight of your heart? The Lord, right? So if you delight yourself in the Lord, guess what? You're going to be really delighted. <laughs> because your delight is going to be found, your desires are going to be in doing what? 
delighting in the Lord. Doesn't mean he doesn't provide the desires of our heart. We just have to be very, very careful when we use that scripture to be reminded that that scripture is pointing back to the fact that if I delight myself in the Lord, he's going to give me the desires of my heart. Man, if I delight myself in him, I'm going to find great, great riches in him. I'm going to find great riches in him. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. So, When we look at the Bible, that name, that wonderful name, Lord, is found in the New Testament and the Old Testament over and over to remind us again that there is someone controlling life, that there is a a manager, there is a, 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 I guess we could say CEO, there's an executive, there's, there's someone who controls life, and it's God himself, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and particularly in the New Testament, it's Jesus who points that out to himself, but Let's take a look at that. It's not just what that Lord means to us. It's not just that. It's what does it mean to you? What does Lord mean to you? What does Lord mean to you? Well, I'm going to see S. Lewis now because I think he gives the classic quote in his book, Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis on page 40 and 41 of his book says this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool or spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and you can call him Lord and God like Thomas did. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He never intended us to have that open. What's he saying? He's got to be Lord. And so when you come to Jesus, you come to a Lord. Now you may not know what that means when you initially come to Jesus Christ, and probably you didn't. I remember when I came to Jesus Christ, I didn't really know. I knew I came to the Lord Jesus Christ because I invited the Lord Jesus Christ into my life, but I didn't know what that meant fully. And throughout my life, guess what? I've been learning more and more and more what that means. That means he's Lord over Gateway Church. He's Lord over my marriage. He's Lord over my health. He's Lord over my friendships. He uh, controls my finances. He's Lord over my relationships. He's Lord over the death of friends, even when I don't fully understand it. He's Lord over some of those tragic moments that I can't completely figure out. He's Lord of all of that. That's what that means. And that's why that word is so, so precious because it goes from someone who's got authority and it appears to be something that seems cold, almost... um, dictatorial to someone who is just constantly concerned about your life. And so wherever you are, saying Jesus is Lord should be a precious thing to you. It should be something that reminds you time and time again that he's in control of your life. Um, Kathy's aunt has a uh, sign on her uh, window that says, uh, Lynn, I am Lord. I think I can handle today pretty well. And I think that's a good statement for all of us. Coming every morning and saying, Lord, you are Lord. You're the one. You're the one that handles my life. You're the Lord when I go into that job interview. You're the Lord when I think about my retirement. You're the Lord when I think about the days ahead and they seem to be really difficult and foggy. You're the Lord. You're the one who's ultimately going to bring it about. So just let me rest in that knowledge that you're the Lord. You're the Lord over my boss. You're the Lord over my neighborhood. You're the Lord over the city. You're the Lord over the country. Oh, guess what? You're even the Lord over the Supreme Court. You're even the Lord over the Congress. You're even Lord over the White House. You're Lord. You're Lord of it all. And so I can just rest in that wonderful knowledge. That's why that's so very, very important. But what about the word Savior? What do we do with that word, that, that beautiful word, Savior? It seems quite different. Someone has once said that if you really read the Gospels, the Gospels are nothing more than passion narratives with large introductions. 
Now, why would they say that? They would say that because really, the Gospels were written to remind us of something. That Jesus came into the world to do what? Save sinners. That really, there's lots of teaching there, and that's great, and all of it is good, and I would agree. But really, Jesus continually reminded his disciples of what? The Son of Man has come not to serve, but to be served, and do what? Give his life a ransom for many. There was this constant, constant reminder that this is why I came. I came to save the world. The word Savior. What does the word Savior really mean? It means a deliverer or a preserver. A deliverer or a preserver. Someone who comes in and delivers. In fact, this is, this is why science fiction spirituality, this is why superhero movies are so um, gripping to people because that's what they do. They come into the world and they deliver or they preserve. They deliver. That's what Batman does. He delivers Gotham City. That's what Superman does. He comes in and he takes on the roles. That's what the Hulk does. That's what all of these superheroes do. If you've been to a movie recently and you've watched the previews, I think you'll see this theme over and over. About half to two-thirds of all the previews seem to be someone comes in from the outside and saves us from ourselves. Over and over again, there's this theme of salvation, this kind of, we need help, and we're not going to find it here on the earth. And so that's what it is. It's someone or something that delivers us, actually, from a terrible plight. Someone or something that delivers us from a terrible plight. That's what a Savior is. And this was the very first announcement. One of the announcements at Jesus' birth. What did the uh, angels say in Luke chapter 2, verse 11? I, today I bring you good news of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a what? Savior who is what? Christ the what? Lord, right? So you've got the two combinations. Right at the very birth announcement, you've got that announcement. There's a Savior and there's a Lord coming. A Savior to uh, preserve you and rescue a Lord to come in and guide you through the rest of your life. That's the problem with so many superhero movies and so many of these science fiction films. They never really gather and they never help you go forward. It's pretty much we've delivered you. Yeah, we've destroyed the city. We've blown everything up. Well, now you're on your own. <laughs> and the Bible says, no, that's not true. You're saved and then the Lord comes in and he helps restore everything back. He helps bring everything back. Now, we might say to ourselves, why? Why do we need a Savior? Let's look at just Genesis 1 through 3 real quick. Why do we need a Savior? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It was a beautiful place, a paradise, an absolute place that we would desire and want with all our hearts to live, unlike anything we could ever imagine. It was this incredible, spectacular place where man walked with God, where men and women walked with God, where they could feel the very breath of God, where their hearts were open to God like a flower to the noonday sun. I mean, it was a perfect environment, a glorious environment. And it will be, come back to us someday, someday in the new heaven and the new earth. But that's what God created. And then you know what this story happens. He creates man in his own image, male and female. They choose to go on their own way to rebel, to disobey God. And what happens? Sin comes into the world. Just as the Bible says, just by one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all have sinned. And so sin came into the world. And if you really look at it, sin is not just missing the mark. It's also corruption. Everything gets corrupt. Everything gets corrupt. The beautiful things that God made suddenly get corrupt. It isn't that they lose every bit of their glory and splendor, but there's a corruption that takes place. It's like a tree that, that is growing, and you look at it and you say, wow, that's a beautiful tree. But that tree with corruption has bugs eating at the inside of it. It may look right, but there's this corruption that came into the world, this sin that has come into the world. And the whole Bible from then on out is really a discussion of men trying to handle that and trying to find ways of dealing with it publicly and privately. And they don't seem to be able to do it. They don't 
be, seem to be able to do it. And why is that? Let's put this little uh, acrostic up here. H-P-T-P-T-U. H-P-T-F-T-U. The human potential to foul things up. The human potential to foul things up. That's exactly what the, what the Bible, and you see it in the Bible. You see this constant fouling up, how humanity is trying their best to get to God. And you see this HPTFTU, the human potential to foul things up over and over and over again. And, that, <coughs> and that's what sin does. It does it corporately. It does it privately. It does it to all of us. We foul things up. We just don't seem to be able to get a handle on everything. No matter what we try to do, we foul things up. One writer said this, and <clears throat> I thought it was a great description, excuse me. <clears throat> we human beings are a, mis are a mysterious, are a mystery to ourselves. We are rational and irrational, civilized and savage, capable of deep friendship and murderous hostility, free and in bondage, the pinnacle of creation and creation's greatest danger. We are Rembrandt and Hitler, Mozart and Stalin, Antonioni and Lady Macbeth, Ruth and Jezebel. What a work of art, says Shakespeare of humanity. We are very dangerous, says Arthur Miller in After the Fall. We meet not in some garden of wax fruit and painted leaves that lie east of Eden, <clears throat> but we meet after the fall, after many many deaths. That's what we are. We're this mixed batch. We just have this constant, constant struggle with ourselves and who we are. And that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need a Savior. We need someone to come in and save us. And there's so many things that Jesus came in to deliver us from and preserve us from. But let's look at a few of them here. If we could just put them on the screen really quick. First of all, Jesus saves us from sin. He saves us from sin because we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Paul says that, that he is the number one chief sinner. And sin is corruption. And if we don't get somebody into our lives to help stop that corruption, it just takes over. And we become what we don't want to be. And sin takes over in our lives. Jesus saves us from sin. He saves us from sin. He saves us from Satan uh, and from death. He saves us from death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. He saves us from death. Oh, not the physical kind of death, but death to ourselves. Death of who we are. And ultimately the eternal death that comes by not following Jesus. He saves us from Satan. From Satan. Second Thessalonians tells us that we were delivered from Satan. The grip of Satan. The foolishness of Satan. The deceptions of Satan. The distractions and deceit of Satan. We're delivered from all of that. He takes that and he delivers us from every single one of that. The wrath of God. We don't talk a lot about the wrath of God, but <clears throat> God will ultimately judge. And in John chapter 3, verse 36, John the Baptist, in talking to his disciples, says, He that believes in the Son has life. He that does not believe does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on them. John knew that the Savior had come into the world when Jesus came into the world. And he says, look, if you believe on him, nothing. You're, you're, you're free from the wrath of God. God shines his favor down on you. And he loves you. And you experience the goodness that Chris talked about. The fact that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. You experience that on a literal existential level. And you're free from the wrath of God and from judgment. And then he saves you from yourself. He saves you from yourself. You know, we make so many tough decisions. We make so many bad situations. We fall into that HPTFTU, right? Human potential to foul things up. And when you know Jesus, the Spirit of God comes into your life and he gives you wisdom and he gives you the word and he gives you a community of people and he saves you from yourself. I was thinking about that the other day. Someone was asking me, I think it might have been Don, Dad, how did you get 
where you are. And I just said, Don, I don't know, actually. I, I don't know. How does one who just, how is one who just, um, you know, is an athlete in, in high school and could care less about study end up having 16 years of post high school college? How does that happen? How does that happen? I mean, I always tell people I had a 4.0 all the way through high school. 1.0 for four years. I mean, how does that happen? Because God came into my life. And if you were to say, well, well how do you, I, I don't know. I don't know. I often tell Don, I went from sporting goods stores to bookstores. How does that happen? My dad always told me, Tom, you're the brawn and your brother is the brain. <laughs> you know, you're the athlete, your brother's the scholar. That's what he always said to me. And how is it that, you know, I read all these books? I mean, I had no desire for any of that. I remember when, when, I, when they were telling me, you know, maybe you could be a pastor. And I used to go into Pastor Bubeck's office and look around at his bookshelves and go, ah, this is not what I want for my life. And now I go into my office and go, look at all those books. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? <clears throat> I mean, it's just one thing. How, do you, how does that happen? I really, I really don't know. I can't really say, except that God came into my life. And who knows where I'd be? I mean, maybe it's a good practice for all of us, isn't it? To stand in front of a mirror every morning and go, Lord, thank you for saving me and saving me from myself because where would I be without you? And if you weren't my Lord organizing and managing and guiding and leading and authority in my life, where would I be? And if you weren't my Savior, where would I still be? And maybe that's a really good practice for all of us to think about on a regular basis, that practice of just reminding ourselves that it's only by the grace of God that we've gotten where we are. I started off this uh, message with um, the Sci-Fi Festival over at the Museum of Science and Industry, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. But I want to show you a picture just to kind of drive this home. <laughs> this is a picture of Jesus <laughs> sitting in the middle of all the superheroes. <laughs> and he tells them, and that's how I save the world. <laughs> that's how I save the world. You can actually order a t-shirt like this online. If you'd like, you can. You can actually order this t-shirt. This is a t-shirt that's offered online. Notice all of them are there. Superman, the Hulk, all of them. And Jesus is, notice Spider-Man is hanging upside down. Good movie. Good prick picture. But Jesus is telling them what? I'm Lord and Savior. And you need me. And that's how I saved the world. Not just one time, but forever for those who know me and love me. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he came into the world for, for us. We thank you for these words, Lord and Savior. We're not just dealing with some great religious leader, although Jesus did establish the greatest of all religions in all the world, Christianity. We're not just talking about a good teacher, although Jesus is the greatest teacher. We're talking about a Lord, someone who has authority, power, and ability, who demonstrated that over and over. And Jesus, we thank you that you're our Savior, that you deliver us and you preserve us, because we sure need it. Not just once, but we need it every day to be reminded again that you deliver us from the things that keep us from becoming all that you envision us to be. And so may we remind people that when they hear these words, Lord and Savior, they're precious, cherished words. And may we be able to tell them about the Lord and Savior we love. We ask this in the name, your name, Jesus. Amen.